the ambition. I'm telling you, I, I've lived in the UK for 13 years. I left from 2005, came back, and I could feel, I could sense the ambition all throughout Saudi Arabia. In, in 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 all places. I mean, in every circle, and in 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 you know that there is a there is a there isn't just a a, a political identity, a foreign policy projection, but there's even a you know something within Saudis now in Saudi society that I that I see myself. Um, but how I see this taking place, and I think with the Abraham Accords and 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 the Arab Peace Initiative, for example, or the Saudi position. Saudi will not join the Abraham Accords and it will not be in its benefit to join the Abraham Accords because it will then be seeming like following a trend set by the UAE, which is what I meant by the legacy. Mm -hmm. This is the legacy here. So now as Saudi Arabia is growing and it's becoming a you know, a global player, not just in oil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's becoming a tourist hub. It's becoming a place where people want to invest. You know, and, and we still have some time to go, but but it's it's going there urgently. Therefore, I think when it comes to Arab-Israeli relations, it will have a framework that speaks to its legacy, not following a legacy of the Abraham Accords. We are speaking now with Dr. Aziz al Kashayan, a Saudi researcher and writer who is, according to one bio we've seen online, a researcher who is fascinated with the elusivity of Saudi foreign policy. Dr. Aziz holds a PhD from the University of Essex in 2019, where he taught international relations, politics, and Middle Eastern studies. He's focused a little bit on Saudi-Israeli relationships budding here recently. So we're very excited to talk to you, Dr. Aziz. Welcome to the 966. Oh, thank you so much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you both. Thank you very much. I, I, we're excited about sort of getting a better grasp of your scholarship on the Abraham Accords and, and the Saudi and the Gulf perspective on these accords. But, you know, there's an elephant in the room, which is that cowboy sign. And, and, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listen, when you talk Saudi diplomacy, it's very hard to avoid the cowboys, I would say, given, given the legacy of Prince Bandar bin Sultan. So, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting story. So I, I, I was actually brought up in the States, which I, I shared with you guys in, in, in Virginia. So my father worked in the yeah. Saudi Embassy there. And then um, uh, I remember my earliest memories. I was actually a Washington Redskins fan. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but you're not old enough to actually have been here when they were great. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're no, like me. no, I, no, definitely. I think when it was the fifth, when they won 52 to 17, that's it, against the Bills. Yeah. I, and it was the last nine, yeah. Nine, yeah. Right. And that's, that's when I was like, I think I better, I better, I better focus on them. And then, uh, and then, and then, so my brother, because he was good friends with uh, Prince Bandar's uh, son Faisal Bandar, who, who's I think um, uh, working on the esports, e e I think, mm. or something. He's, oh. he, he, he's a good guy. He's a real good guy. And um, so he's uh, they they were friends. And then of course, so I think I was socially conditioned to like the Cowboys, and it, it kind of spilled over from from that uh, from that legacy of Prince Bandar into into, into this house. <laughs> So that's, well, that's I, I'd like to say we're all now Commanders fans here, but yeah, yeah of so, course. so bad for so long. That is not the case. It, yeah. it, as, you, as you said, <laughs> you said you were out in, in the area recently and when you picked up that Cowboys uh, sign yeah. and, and it was what, the second best seller? It was the second best seller. Uh, and that was uh, because I wanted to ask. I was like, listen, what, what, you know, how, how? Because I went there, I bought a hat too. There was a, in another place, and then some guy was like, "Yo, man, what are you doing, man? What, what's and what are you doing?" And he was giving me all this kind of crap, and I was like, and then I forgot that that you know I'm in Washington territory here right. and buying buying this. So then and then I kind of remember that banter, and then so when I asked the guy, I'm like, "Do they buy it to burn this or something, or do they buy it? To, <laughs> I, you know, I, what, what's going on here?" And then they're they're like, "Listen, it's 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 the best seller. It's 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 the best seller here." 
And uh, the Eagles were pretty good, pretty high up there. Giants were pretty high up. You also, we're lucky to have you. You're calling. You. You're you're joining us from Riyadh. You were you were talking about. You said it's been raining. You you have a family farm just outside of Riyadh. Yes. So I was actually there. I was um, New Year's. I wanted to go there. I finished a couple of things kind of last week, and then um, so we we went to a place called Droma, Droma, Saudi Arabia, and it was on the it's it's past the the Gidea where the Six yeah. Flags is going to be, and me and my nephew we knew it was going to be rainy uh, and so we decided we we're like listen let's just go to the farm and make the most out of this beautiful weather that's gonna happen sometimes sometimes they say it's gonna rain and then it doesn't rain but then we were like listen let's just make the most out of this and it's been raining non-stop for the past uh few days i think today was the easiest day that that you know eased up a little bit so i i i, I mean you you guys were very close <laughs> you're seeing a very scruffy very cold unshaved uh m messy hair disease uh, on the 96 but uh, but then i said i don't want to make my first appearance on the 966 uh like this so so it's been there and and the farm is uh it, it's been on the family for ages and 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 so so we raise so my brother uh raises camels there uh my other brother has um he's a horse fan so he has a lot of horses there um or a few horses but the interesting about my brother who who was in AU i think in the early 2000s uh -huh. left AU came back to Saudi and then became one of the i would say one of the top people in Saudi that know about camels he's so passionate about it um and there was a there was a period of time where we actually had ostriches uh in, in, in the farm Sweet. And they had a yeah they really had a they had they really had a weird sound um, <laughs> that it was very it was very interesting uh and it was a very colorful time at the farm when they were there uh, oh, is it a time. good is it a good egg i, I hear ostrich eggs are okay it's like massive. really big yeah <laughs> I, I i thought i was walking into a dinosaur museum or something it, it, it was like a it was like a big thing and and um yeah so we used to collect it and then i think i don't know what happened but you know it Sa saudi the saudi sun is very uh it's, it's ruthless <laughs> it's ruthless yeah. it takes us so long things so so tell us so you grew up here in, yeah. you know in, in northern virginia but all your your ma you you, you your ma your ba and your doctorate are all yeah. in the uk yeah, 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 and yeah. You so also, you also spent, uh, you know, you were at Sandhurst, which is, you know, a, a famous military academy. Yeah. What well, yeah. were, were, were you? A, were you a troublemaker as a kid? They sent you. <laughs> <laughs> Was I or still yeah. am? I, I don't know. That's that's the that's the question. <laughs> no, I so I was. Yeah, I was brought up in, in the U.S. And then I think actually what's really interesting was that the, the plan was always to go back to the US and study there uh, for, for my for my B, BA and MA. And, and I've always wanted to study international relations. So I, I went, um, I, I was planning on going there, uh, but it, unfortunately, it was just after about 9-11, I think remnants of, you know, Islamophobia and, and, and just people were very worried. Um, so I think it wasn't an option. Um, so we looked elsewhere and then and then the first thing that came up actually was Sandhurst. And and I was like, you know, I heard about this place. I'm not really sure. And then I realized you had to really run a lot. So I was like, all right. <laughs> and then I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to do that for a while. So so yeah, it was actually I'm really blessings come in disguises sometimes. And and while I really wanted to go back and 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 of course live in the states and and experience you know the university in the in the, in the United States in DC where I feel home to be honest with you because I went there I was brought up there um, but you know I went to uh, the UK and I got you know a very interesting um, very interesting experience there grew up and 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 you know developed in of course Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. I was there actually at a very interesting time. Um, so Prince Harry and Prince William were there at the same time. So I remember even playing football and, and they were playing football there as well, especially Prince Harry. Yeah, and, um, and they, you know, those people, they shouted at everyone uh, <laughs> equally. 
and they were really <laughs> shouted. They were, all, they were all part of it. Yeah, they were all part of it. They all shouted at, at everyone equally. It was it was very it was a very interesting time to be there. Uh, and then I I, I commenced my uh, BA and MA and PhD and then lectured. So I stayed. The majority of my life is actually in the UK, and hence the British accent that I have now. So and, and so let's let's talk about let's talk mm. about your scholarship, which we find very interesting. And and we first got together because you wrote a a, a really interesting article. Um, back in April. Mm. 2021 for the yeah. Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. And and as anybody knows or listen to 966, we're big fans of of Arab Gulf States. They do really oh, good my, scholarship yeah. and yeah. have a lot of really uh, intelligent, thoughtful people there. But the, the article is entitled Misleading Elements in mm. Current Gulf Israeli Discourse. Mm. And it and it spoke, you know, it was directly addressed the uh, Abraham Accords. Mm. And so it, it was an excellent article. We recommend it. And so we wanted to get we wanted to get Dr. Aziz on to talk about this because I, I think this is the Abraham Accords are fascinating to me. They remind me of that that old parable about, you know, six blind men and an elephant. Mm. You know, where, you know, one one's touching the, you know, the the hide and said, This is a wall, one's touching the, you know, the, the tail and this is a snake, one yeah. touches the, the trunk and I mean, the tail, it's a rope and you know the trunk is a snake. Anyway, you, you know you you have all these different judgments and and you know determinations of what it is we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you get to that very very uh, accurately and and effectively in your piece. Before we do that, you know, yeah. I feel like we should give a little context of the Abraham Accords for our listeners, yeah. just so we have a good starting point. Yeah, yeah. And and you you it, you I'll throw it out there and you interject here and correct me uh, sure. and add and, and edit as needed. But, you know, I think by any measure, these are significant agreements. And these were first ones with uh, with Israel and the UAE and Bahrain, Israel and Bahrain in September 2020. Um, later in December 2020, Morocco joined the accord in January 2021, Sudan joined the, uh, joined the accord. And, and essentially, it's important because these are the first uh, diplomatic relationships established with Arab states by Israel since 1994, when mm. and that was with Jordan. So you have, you know, a, a 30 year interlude essentially there. Mm. Um, so it's a big step. And I think we have to recognize that there's been some real benefits, especially economically. I think in, in the UAE, there's been a, a record 1.4 billion uh, uh and in you and in trade with Israel in the first seven months of 2022, you know, a, a significant uptick in, in Israeli tourism, 450,000 Israeli tourists. Again, this was by the middle of the year last year. Morocco, again, uh, bilateral relationships greatly expanded. Uh, they hope to reach $250 million in trade next year. Again, huge uptick, fourfold uptick in Israeli tourism. Bahrain uh, and Israel signed over 40 MOUs, you know, largest defense agreement with, you know, significant multilateral implications. Uh, Sudan, you know, less active. Uh, and we'd have to recognize that both Sudan and, and Morocco, I think that their entrance into the Abraham Accords was a little more political in nature. Um, you know, maybe a little less organic than the UAE and Israel. That's true. Yeah. Um, but then well, I had with one, the Sudan one. one. Sorry to interrupt here, but with the Sudan yeah. one, it's actually still not ratified because uh -huh. it's waiting for the 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 democratic elected government or the parliament. That so it's under this. Um, it's still under uh, the 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 military kind of regime right now. Uh, it's this transitional council. And so in order for it to be adopted and agreed, uh, the, the parliament has to ratify it, which there, there wasn't one being ratified already because they, they're not functioning. So interesting. So that's that's the thing about the Abraham Accords with Sudan that officially they haven't yet normalized. And, and I think with Morocco, it didn't start off as a normalization. It started off as a kind of an elevation of relations at first. And then it, it then I think a year after, um, which is, you know, not long ago, um, it, it, the relations were elevated to uh, a normalization of relations, of diplomatic recognition, et cetera. 
Go so on. this is why I'm really looking forward to the conversation and yeah. why I think it's valuable because you're very meticulous about being accurate. Yeah. Well, and it, right. it's important. Yeah. yeah. And and just one closing thought on sort of the scene center. Uh, there was a Negev Forum Summit mm. in, 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 in March of this year, which is significant. You had six foreign ministers from, you know, four Arab states, yeah. uh, uh, Bahrain, Egypt, Morocco, and the UAE, UA, uh, as well as Israel and the U.S. Secretary of State meeting in Israel, um, you know, so there's a con ongoing conversation. This wouldn't have happened previously. So it's significant. So you can look at the Abraham Accords, you know, uh, established in late 2020 and say, okay, this is promising. There's something here. Um, it, what I, I'd like to do, and, and one of the really excellent things about your piece, um, and you very specifically state, you know, that, that there cannot be an accurate understanding of any relationship with an act without an accurate discourse surrounding it. Yes. And you, 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 you state that in the discourse on the agreement between Gulf Arab states and Israel, and I think for our purposes, we'll probably focus mostly on UAE and Bahrain mm. um, in Israel. Uh, in the discourse on the agreements between the Gulf Arab states and Israel, three particular notions have been oversimplified or exaggerated. Uh, one, you mentioned alliances. Two, the Gulf, in quotes, yes. as a monolith. I'll make sure to put that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you will sure have, with everybody, all at once now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and three, the centrality of Iran. Yeah. So um, let's, let us let me push start with you sure. on this, Dr. Aziz. You know, what, you know, what is normalization? How is it, how is it misunderstood? But let, walk us through what mm. you say, what, what you point out as, as three major points of, of n where there's not accuracy on the discourse. Yeah. So, so I, I think to build upon, firstly, your introduction and your preface was, was very much accurate. And, and, and I'd like to use it to build upon um, also the relations uh, between uh, some GCC states and Israel. So there were relations before, official relations uh, with them historically. So it was Oman and Qatar that developed relations with um, with the Israel uh, right. in the mid-90s. And this actually came against the backdrop of the Oslo Accords and also kind of this, this notion of there is a push for peace and I think you, if if people look at you know even Prince Bandar bin Sultan's book, um, The Prince, and 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 others, there's always this idea of all right, here's here's an effort um, that's gonna you know hopefully we could make a, a push for peace. So uh, they had business relations with Israel, and then it was around 2002 it was kind of then seized, official relations. Uh, the unofficial is com something completely different. Uh, but then the, unof you know, the, so that was the first relation. So there was a precedent of GCC, respective GCC states and, and Qatar and, and so Qatar and Oman with, with, with Israel. Well, can uh, I interrupt just briefly? Sure. Is there any significant about 2002? That was the Arab peace plan, the King Abdullah peace plan, yes. correct? Yes, okay. yes, yes. It, it was that some sort of, is it, you know, why did, why did those relationships, the, the Qataris and the Omanis, why, why did that? Yeah, well, it, it 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 because it was after the Intifada, and it was uh, during the Intifada, which is, by the way, the the two thousand and two Arab Peace Initiative was an extension of the Intifada. Mm -hmm. It was a result of the Intifada. It was a way of saying, okay, here is a framework to deal with this Intifada, and and that was the calculation. So it didn't just come out of nowhere, and of course, it was, you know, also carrying on from the Camp David Accords and the, the failure of the Camp David Accords um, or the Camp David effort, I think, in, in Yehud Barak and Arafat and Clinton, et cetera. And then and that felt that led to the to the um, Intifada of, of 2000, the end of 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, what postponed the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative, uh, which was based on the Saudi Peace Initiative, which was a month prior uh, and what postponed it was 9-11, was the September 11 attacks. Mm. It was actually, it was a response. It was a response to the Intifada immediately, but then once the 9-11 happened, and then obviously the world changed, and, and the right. United States was not in any 
kind of mentality to to receive any kind of peace talks at this moment at that moment uh, you know so that was postponed so that's why people are are you know sometimes think it's an it's an isolated incident when actually it's actually it's a, it's an extension of it uh, yeah yeah and and um and that's a legacy in its own by the way and and that's why in recently in Netanyahu when he said you know we have to move on from the Arab peace initiative um because of it, it has a legacy of uh, addressing the Palestinian issue when the Abraham Accords is, is now a, a, another legacy of something else that I, I will will get into. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I think there's competing legacies here between the Abraham Accords and the Arab Peace Initiative. But I think with the Arab, with the Abraham Accords, it is indeed a milestone, as you say, you know, or, or as you, you, you very much, it, this is not a, this is not a small thing that just took place. You know, uh, this changed the political landscape of the Arab-Israeli relations. And I think for me, I always use the term Arab-Israeli relations a lot more than I would with Arab-Israeli conflict, because I think historically, I've always researched um, the commonalities that Saudi Arabia and Israel had and Arab states and Israel had even days before they were even recognizing each other. I mean, even, I'm sorry, days before they were recognized as states. I mean, this goes back to early 20th century communication, cooperation, very implicit form. So for me, Arab-Israeli relations is something so interesting and so worth looking into because it actually builds new concepts of how people consider and conceptualize relations you know it, it expands the vocabulary really of how people talk about how interstates or interstate relations take place and that's why i said there has to be a political there has to be a new discourse or or a befitting discourse and one of the misleading elements was this notion of alliances and 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 you know alliances for me i think in my phd because my phd was precisely on the Saudi foreign policy towards Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's the book project that I'm currently working on now. Um, it's w- one of the things, what I, one of the things that I argue is say is, is that I say, listen, okay, alliances, it's sometimes it's been considered as a Saudi Israeli alliance, that there is an underground alliance. And that's just complete and utter, it's just flawed, you know, because alliances in nature are, obligatory contractual forms of 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 cooperation mm-hmm. you know they're very obligatory they're very contractual they're overt and they're meant to be overt uh, and therefore so this then begs the question why do people use alliances then and in my opinion i think one of the things that they use it is to as a political weapon as a political instrument to demonize either you see the anti saudi bloc in the region always uh, equivocating or always correlating Saudi Arabia with Israel, with the Zionists. They're the allies of the Zionists. They're the allies of Israel. Look at how bad they are. Look at this. Look at that. They're, see, they're the allies. It's, it's a strong projection. Mm-hmm. It's a strong description of relations in order to demonize. And at the same time, you get on the other side with you have people within Israel that politicize it and say, well, we're allies already, aren't we? And this is what Netanyahu said to, I think, in a 60-minute interview yes. 2016. He's like, the alliance is already there. And of course, what is he doing? He's he's politicizing this relationship. But actually, there isn't a Saudi-US alliance. And this is one of the things that I talk about in the, in the piece. And mm-hmm. there isn't even an Israeli-American alliance. In, in that the, in, form. The, in the truest form of the term. In, the, in the truest form of the term, you're right. In the, in right. the essence of it, there's a political obligation. And, and why do people use it interchangeably is because sometimes in alliances, and thank you for, for, for emphasizing this notion, but sometimes in alliances like NATO, ally, allies don't tend to work very well sometimes. Yeah. So in some instances where there is no official you know the the truest form of this of 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 relations sometimes they work very very well so it's it but it's important to discuss that and and just to illustrate 
what kind of descriptions and categories are we using? When we're using the term alliance, sorry, just, I want to ask really quickly, are we talking about like a firm U.S. treaty, like it, like Congress would pass a treaty? Is that is that sort of right? And then everything else is sort of loosely, you know, Saudi Arabia, Israel, but yeah. we only have a firm alliance with, like you said, NATO, things that went through Congress. Is that sort of correct? Well, I think it, it for me, I consider it um, in the sen- in the military sense. And the fact that that there is an obligation to react whenever there is whenever there is a country that is under threat, mm-hmm. all for one and one for, for for all that kind of notion, and in that kind of notion there isn't one. Mm-hmm. This is something Martin Indyk said, the the former uh, American ambassador to uh, to Israel. Israel. Yeah. It, you know, and 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 so, you know, when and I even in that piece I actually put a, a, a reference to all the alliances um, that, that were studied. I think I, I forgot by who there was a study about all the alliances that were taking place. So so this term alliances, you know, it, 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 is an, it is an exaggerated form, but sometimes we don't know that we're using it and, 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 and a lot of statesmen use it, you know, but, but that's, I think it's important just to f- emphasize on this kind of. Well, thing. And you make a you make a very good point about you know different sides claiming you know their interpretation of what an alliance is, but you know that the opening the, the the opening of that to me it seems is that what is normalization? Mm. I mean, I don't I don't know what normalization is. I, I've read the I've read the the Abraham Accords and the and the verbiage. Um, and it is really interesting when you go through the Abraham Accords. We'll get to this point, your your point later. There's nothing about Iran, but um, you you know what is normalization? And it, it seems it sounds as if when you read the document, well, this is sort of a, 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 a you know a normalization of diplomatic relations. Mm. Um, but you're exactly right. It's no, it's not a, it's not a contractual agreement. It's not a, you're not signatory to to you know, it's not an Article Three of NATO. Exactly. Um, so, you know, what is normalization? And because it leaves it wide open, because you have, I mean, it's fascinating to me that, you know, you met, you referenced uh, Netanyahu, who has just been reelected as prime minister, and, you know, one of the most right-wing, aggressive, you know, uh, uh, governments in the history of Israel, immediately talking about normalization, you know, relationships with, with Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly politicized, as you say. No, no, it, it is. And I, and I, and, and you, I mean, you're very much spot on there when it comes to well, what is normalization, and 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 somehow normalization seems to be also very much misunderstood. And I think, you know, one of the aspects that, um, or one of the times um, that uh, made me realize how just bad people understand normalization, or how the general media discourse, Western centric discourse, I would say. Uh, misunderstand sometimes normalization was during the Biden visit to Saudi Arabia uh, in 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 July. So when mm-hmm. he was visiting Jeddah, maybe you guys recall. I'm sure you guys. I'm sure you guys recall. There was this idea that well, okay, we might not get normalization, but what about getting an air defense alliance? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> and, and it and for me that sounded like. And I remember telling someone that sounded like. Um, Saying, you know what, I'm Aziz. I'm, I'm I'm on a diet here. I'm not gonna have that small piece of candy, but I will have that massive chocolate cake all to myself. <laughs> you know, with with with, it, with this idea, it's it's a misunderstanding. As if it's like, no, an air defense alliance is okay, but not normalization. You know, and it's actually these the people that are normalized their you know relations together. And by the way, normalization, um is always has different meanings with different partners and different protagonists, the people that are involved, Clearly. Yeah. Um, you know, the meaning of normalization and what is to be normalized and what is not to be normalized is something very different. So for example, when they are talking about Saudi Arabia and Turkey normalization of relations, they're not saying an absence of, of uh, diplomatic ties, you know, they're talking about an elevation of, of ties yeah. an improvement of ties. Okay, that normalization is clearly different than the Saudi-Israeli norm- potential normalization, for example. Right. So here, normalization is always it's 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 very much fluid, according to really what the context and the partners and the participants are, 
regarding this. And 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 to be honest, I mean that's why many people, I think, and and, and you know, I, I I won't blame many people for misunderstanding it because it, it the the meanings of it constantly change. And but I think it's important just to say, listen, it's it's it, it, these things do change, you know, and, and that's why it's hard to put our finger on it sometimes. Well, it's fascinating, and I want to I want to move to the uh, uh, another point you made because I, I think you know our understanding of the alliance is a normalization. I mean, it, it's clearly it's not it's seen as different things by different sides. Um, you also talk about the Gulf and and the habit of people of, of referring to the Gulf as a unified uh, political economic body. Uh, you know, in, in sync with their their strategies and so on and so forth, and. and and this is not the case. Yes. So I think for me, one of the things that, uh, one of the, the, the good things intellectually about the Abraham Accords was that it elucidated the differences within the GCC. You know, it, it illustrated the fact that firstly, people within the GCC, just because they wear a shamar on the head and they wear a thobe, uh, doesn't mean they all think alike. Doesn't mean they all have the same policy. Doesn't mean they all have the same ideology, have the same rationality. And I think this is one of the, for me, the top things about the Abraham Accord really was intellectual was to show that, listen, the GCC is actually very dynamic here. You know, uh, Saudi Arabia has its position. Um, Qatar made its very, its position. We, you know, with, with, with by the way with they never deny they have relations with with israel because yeah. they, they have to have it and uh, work they have what they call working relations with israel because of hamas uh, or the gaza strip uh, kuwait is an outright kind of um you know very antagonistic towards normalization oman only recently by the way uh while they hosted uh, while um netanyahu visited sultan Qaboos. Mm -hmm. in 2018 but then they uh only two days ago they expanded the boycott of israel well and, 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 and correct me and so it's different it's it's constantly different and and if i just may, yeah. may if i can make this point here it's so different of course the uae has its position and a, a lot of the times people are talking about you know a uh, little little bahrain of course i think bahrain is one of the most fascinating aspects here because Bahrain is playing a very interesting balancing game between Saudi Arabia and the UAE in regards to the Arab it, it, it seems like you know it's it's the Arab peace initiative and the Abraham Accords and it's playing this particular balance and it's so it so it's just fascinating to see this um sorry I know and, and and your point is well made but and you talk about getting in, in, in the nuance and the actual being accurate if if I I may be mistaken but my understanding the the, the great deliverable quote unquote and this is one of the things we've talked about in 966 you know we didn't feel like the, the the president Biden visit to Saudi Arabia and also the meeting with heads of state of the GCC and of surrounding nations you know both those things happen. Uh, was really about deliverables. It was about trying to reestablish a relationship that was workable. That was yeah. our opinion. But one of the deliverables that certainly pro-Israeli elements uh, talked about was, you know, you know, Israeli flights were now uh, had overflight uh, uh, capability over over Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia said, "Look, we open it up for everybody." And of course, this mm -hmm. is advantageous not only going but also any flights to to the to the Far East and that sort of thing. But I gather that it hasn't been much benefit for these Israeli airlines because Oman has not allowed overflights yeah. to these yeah. Israeli aircraft. I think they're talking about it now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But to your point is, you know, when you get down into it, there's all sorts of, you know, things that uh, don't appear as they, they seem. Uh, and it's just, a, it's just a fascinating sort of examination. Um, it is. Sorry, I'm, uh, go on. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm really, I'm really <clears throat> intrigued by your, and, and we just stumbled upon this, by your description of the, the Arab peace, uh, our Arab peace plan, the O2 Arab peace plan, and, and then Abraham Accords. So if if I could dumb this down, really dumb this down, essentially the Arab peace plan is about the occupied territories. Essentially, Abraham Accords, from the Israeli perspective, is about Iran. Mm. Is that accurate? Uh, 
I would I would say the the fur the former was accurate. It's about air, the t- territories. Uh, the Abraham Accords. The, I, I'll say it this way: uh, the Abraham Accords. It's not the Abraham Peace Accords. It's the Abraham Business Accords. <laughs> yes, there you go. And I think, yeah, and and I think what's what's really fascinating about this, and what's also historical about, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, while I have my opinions about things, I, I never try to just throw away a framework that that is used as a as a as a as or, or alleged to to solve an issue. You know, let's let's give something a try and let's see what happens. But I think, you know, what was very interesting about the Abraham Accords uh, was that it was not about uh, a conflict. It was about the materialization of interests mm-hmm. and, and, and business interests and economic interests. And, um, y- y- you know, this is what separates it from the, the peace deals with Jordan and also peace deals with the the peace deal with uh, with Egypt mm-hmm. in 1979 so you know of course there wasn't a border dispute between them for example so this is what was historic about it and the fact that it, there wasn't an aspect of of transaction transactionality there wasn't a transaction there wasn't a land for peace thing which of course what was interesting was this uh, idea that in my opinion why it, it, now I, I don't like to just criticize things for the critics, but now it's just becoming clear that, you know, the Abraham Accords has become, is a limited framework uh, because it does not address or did not address the core issues that really people cared about. Because what happened was that it was, it, when it first was framed, it was first framed as, okay, Israel's going to stop annexation and then in return for annexation the halting of annexation we will then normalize relations with you this w- this was the entry point this was the kind of the foundation of it but actually the the annexation was postponed but it was d- it was kind of viewed and the reason why it's postponed is because if you could just look at the discourse of the current israeli government now with elements in it that makes netanyahu looks like a dove i mean if netanyahu looks like a dove with the people in it what does that say about the others so and they're talking about you know and they're talking about annexation again so what does that say about that original part? so what is historic about it and we cannot deny the fact that business ties have have grown dramatically because they're not only big comp they're not only good uh robust economies they're very complementary economies uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. with Israel and you know, very technically advanced here. One is a startup, the other one's a scale up. Um, you know, a, 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 and so they are complementary. And no one's, no one, you know, no one is is surprised about that. But it's also important to say what you know that the limitations of it, and that's why for me the Arab Peace Initiative was a framework that addresses these issues and allows for normalization of relations well let's talk about public attitudes because i love that i love your framing of this is a business you know abraham business accords because i really i do feel like you know there's significant elements on both sides but particularly from from the south let's say the saudi side you know this is what they're looking at i mean saudi arabia is on an enormous gam you know bet on its future trying to diversify and just refashion its whole economy it wants investment. It sees obviously Israel is, is a technological dynamo in many ways. Um, but uh, Washington Institute, which is a sort of a, a, a pro-Israeli you know think tank here in Washington, in March 2022 did a, an interesting survey of the of the Gulf countries, the Abraham Accord uh, nations. Um, and we'll just look at Saudi Arabia. And and the question is, what is your view of Abraham? This is of of, of the average Saudi. You know, what is your view of the Abraham Accords between Israel and UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan? Now, sort of the political framework. And the, and and mm-hmm. in Saudi Arabia, only 19%. Well, 9% very positive, 10% somewhat positive. So 19%. Right? When the when the question was refamed, what do you, uh, people who want to have business and sports contracts, business and sports contacts with Israelis should be allowed to do so. 
mm. you know, and the so strongly agree and some would agree in Saudi Arabia, it bumped up to close to 40%. Mm. You know, uh, so essentially, again, and, and, and I'll, I'll simplify for the purpose of thing, you, you know, from the Saudi perspective, okay, we're not comfortable with the political proposition. We're certainly comfortable with the person to person and the business and, and, and those aspects of, of growing the relationship. Is that accurate? Yes. And, and, and to be honest, uh, the, the thing that you said here that I really appreciate was the framing because also, uh, and I'll talk a little bit after I kind of engage with this one about, about framing and in my kind of experience in, in, in trying to uh, see engage where people's view or uh, views are on Israel here within Saudi Arabia, but what this, this is positive for me. I think mm -hmm. what what this because of course people have their political issues, and 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 people do view this as a political issue, not as a as a personal uh, anti-Israeli issue. That the problem isn't because you are Israeli, the problem is because of this per you know this particular your policies. this particular issue yeah. of the policies, yeah. and and for me, this is positive. Because there, you know, if there's anything more complex than, you know, the, the, I think Israel is probably the most complex state in 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 the entire Middle East. I mean, it, it is. Uh, uh, I remember one time being told, um, and when I gave commentary, I give commentary on, okay, obviously Saudi relations towards Israel or Arab others relations with Israel, Israel foreign policy, etc. They were like, well, let's talk about the uh, elections. And I was like, oh, 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 absolutely not, because I'm, I'm not. This is, this is way too much for me. And they, in, in, in Israeli civil society, is something so rich, you know, that uh, there's a. You'd be surprised of how many people agree with so many things. And I personally think there's a lot more that we agree than we disagree uh, on the person or person person or person level. Okay. Uh, personally this is through my experience with 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 israelis uh, a lot of them a lot of them are anti-occupation a lot of them understand a lot of them call for the arab peace initiative some of them call i don't want to say a lot some of them call for the arab peace initiative and you get this um, um, unbelievable nuance of arab israeli relations which is which i'm really dedicated to trying to just highlight and just say listen everyone around the world this isn't just arab versus jew this isn't just muslim versus versus israeli there they we you know agree we have a lot more commonalities than many people think we are and i think living in the united kingdom i saw this problem that we in the in the middle east and particularly arab israeli relations face which is that arab israeli relations suffers from a more catholic than the pope syndrome mm -hmm. that i think when it comes to people from abroad and, and with all due respect, I mean, people from, you know, abroad, they, 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 when they start talking about this issue, immediately you get the conservative side deciding here. I'll talk more about, you know, in the UK, conservative side here. Yeah, we're pro-Israeli. Why? Uh, just because like, you're not mine, you know, I got to be, you know, pro-Israeli. And then and then when you go on the, the, the left wing, more liberal left wing, and then all of a sudden, yeah, free, free Palestine. Okay, do you know this is true? You got to fight for it. You got to fight for the country. And then you're like, well, okay. But the Palestinians, some of them are not saying, no, we have to fight. Some of them are saying, no, we have to have, we need to have this kind of interrelations and we need, it's nuanced. And, I'm, and what I'm saying to those people is saying, listen, you got to privilege the voices of those people here and listen to them and say, hey, you know, we actually agree. We don't, the problem is that those other, you know, De debate be it in oxford or in cambridge or when you have for the motion against the motion very binary structure it 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 just constructs a very binary lens and it's privilege it's you know if it's coming from oxford or if it's coming from cambridge or if it's coming from harvard then it, it must be a thought you know very authoritative about this and and this is now the dominant narrative and that's what i'm that's why I appreciate people like yourselves, quite frankly, is that, you know, you're hosting, you have a nuanced attitude, and that's what's missing about this relation, especially Arab-Israeli, because it's very tempting to, to view it from a lens of 
uh, of conflict. It's not difficult to use it from a lens of cooperation. Um, and I think that's what I'm trying to do. You know, still, it's this, still this process. Right. And also about framing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, may I say, or Absolutely. go I, I, about the framing. This is what you say is very fascinating because when I speak with Saudis and I tell them, hmm, what do you think about Israel? And it depends on the frame. So when you look at Israel and then you say, well, what about Israel and Iran or Israel and and Hezbollah or the Houthis, you, you see them, you know, contemplating and you're like, oh, you know, I don't see Israel as actually a real problem here. I really see it as an issue, you know, not really. I mean, there you didn't see much from them, et cetera, much negative things. I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah. Well, what about Israel and, for example, Al-Aqsa? You know, and, and, what, and what do you mean by Al-Aqsa? And I say, well, sovereignty over Al-Aqsa. And immediately you get this mm -hmm. jolting. You're like, uh, uh, what? Uh, on Al-Aqsa? How dare they? Ah, okay. So you're starting to think about the importance of framing when it comes to Israel-Saudi relations. What is it and what frame is it in? And then you get people talking about it. And that's why that's why I really appreciate this point about framing. It's because it's very, very elusive. And that's the point that I kind of, that's why I like to, to, you know, mention that word when I describe Saudi foreign policy. Well, and it's the perceptions are it, it is. I mean, we, uh, so much of our dialogue, public discourse is characterized by the polar extremes. And then obviously that's the case in, in the U.S. And, and it's the same thing in, in Israel. I mean, uh, uh, not so much lately, but for, for a long time, if you ask the, stand, the you know, surveys of a, of a regular, you know, man in the street, Israeli, mm -hmm. and they talk about relationship with Palestine and and they're very open and optimistic, but the minute you say something like, "What about a what about a a, a capital in East Jerusalem?" Shut down. Mm. It's like Al Aqsa. Exactly. You know, so you yeah. know there are red lines, and it's mm. those red lines that you know continue to to struggle. You know, everyone struggles with now. Um, but I, I do think it, it is interesting when we talk about media and that sort of thing. Let's talk, if we can. You know, we we talked a lot about the World Cup. Uh, on the nine six six because it was just it's just an amazing uh, amazing event it was it was quite uh, a benchmark and and uh, a milestone to have it you know be held in a, in, a, in an Arab country and and you know it it was just so much to discuss it was really rich one of the interesting things about the world and 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 anytime you go into an event this large the largest sporting event in the globe you know you got things are going to happen one of the things that i think surprised and caught people by surprise is the sort of public gestures and, and of support for palestine mm. what what mm. in what does you know what does that reflect in your opinion uh, well firstly above all i think the the qatar world cup was probably the best world cup uh, i i've seen ever uh it was so fantastic it was. honestly it was, a, <laughs> it, it, was, was awesome. such a, it was it was so it was i mean it was unbelievable quite frankly it was so entertaining and 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 a part of me is happy that it's over because i could get back to doing some work <laughs> now you admitted you're an fc barcelona guy yeah All right, and, yeah yeah and, and solution is as a chelsea guy yeah oh <laughs> Yeah, do, Chelsea we, guy. do we have to end this? Do we, uh, episode seventy is over. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's were another, you another episode? That's another. Go on. Were you rooting for Messi because he's a former Barca guy? No, absolutely. He yeah. deserved it. Mm -hmm. he, was, he, he deserved. It. I was so happy for him personally, and I think everyone was. You know, everyone was like rooting for him. I I actually remember just before, just really quick. I remember watching Messi's first game play. Really? And right. Yeah, I remember because he's only he's a year younger than i yeah. so uh, and then but he looks a lot a lot younger than i do though <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do the phd and get stuck on the on the, on the he's too busy just making make being awesome so <laughs> <laughs> he i remember this and i remember reichardt so frank reichardt was the coach or head coach or manager as they say in the united kingdom and then they would say uh, and i remember saying what's reichardt doing playing with these little kids you know, I, but we want to see the big players. I did not know I was talking about Lionel Messi. You know? and that, that was, that, I remember that. I always remember that. But I think it goes back to the, to the point of uh, the World Cup. What that does illustrate is firstly this notion that, listen, Palestine is still something people care about. You know, it, 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 it is 
I, I gave a, a comment on the, to the New York Times um, about this. They they asked for my quote, and and I just said it. You know, the occupation is just too big to sweep under the rug. You know, we could we could all we could have forward thinking relations with Israel. We could have you know aspects of okay, the Abraham Accords. It's a different way of thinking. You could move forward. You could you could develop relations. You 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 know, but that is one thing that. It's just very, very difficult to just negate. That is not the 800 pound gorilla in the room. That is the 1600 pound gorilla in the room, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it is, it is. I mean, um, and so that is, that's one thing. The second thing for me, and this is why it's important to constantly be in touch with Israeli colleagues with 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 Israeli academics, with Israeli analysts, which I, I am, because we need to we need to understand one another a lot, was that they said many people in Israel were very surprised about that. You know, they literally did not expect that. They expected because of the discourse of the Abraham Accords, that mm -hmm. Arab, you know, everyone's gonna start loving and hey, and you know, you're welcome, and this and that and the other. And that did not happen. And that's what they, you know, some of my colleagues said, you know, this is why, this is why you have to address the issue. There's just simply no dancing around this issue. And and I remember telling them, you know, I take no glee in this. I, I, I take no glee in seeing a journalist, an Israeli journalist say, hey, you know, I was like, I don't want to talk with you. You know, some may, some may, there's a, some may use it because there's political point scoring a lot of the mm -hmm. times there's political point scoring. And some of these, by the way, the way some of these interviews are done is for political point scoring too. The frames also, to, to be to be honest. Um, but I remember saying to a friend, I, I hope one day uh, an Israeli, um, an Israeli uh, journalist could visit an Arab country and they could ask them about how well the Palestinian national football team played. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I that's what I strive for. And that's what I think is something that is in what infuriates me is how tangible peace can be. But it's just sometimes language and perceptions and social perceptions make it tempting for politicians to take the easy way out. And 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 that so that's my my overarching career goal, I would say, is to try to build these bridges by trying to look at the nuances of relations and, and focus on the commonalities, not the differences, you know? Well, uh, I'm a, uh, w one comment on that. And I, earlier, I, I simplified, and, and it was really from the Israeli point of view, but I think it's been, when I said, you know, Israel, you know, it's once, you know, the Abraham Accords is about the occupied territories, the Abraham Accords is about Iran. I think, you know, from many in Israel, really, would like that, you know, the enemy, my enemy is my friend doctrine to sort of supersede everything else. Yeah. Uh, and, and as you've pointed out and you make very clear in all your analysis is that's not the case. Um, you know, the, the, you know, Arab and the Gulf States, you know, partners in the Abraham Accords, that's not their motivation. Uh, and it had to be a little bit bracing again for the, the people in those camp to see the the groundswell and and the societal support for Palestine, but let me ask a question. It might be hard to answer. Mm. Is it a matter of time? Mm. Is it just a matter of time? And and we understand that we have one side sort of trying to frame it. So let's ha have it happen now. Uh, and then the other side say, no, no, you're looking at one thing. We're actually considering another, and we've, we're we're prioritizing another. But they are talking. There are there are increasing uh, levels of human to human interaction, business interaction, business interplay, investment opportunities. Um, is it a matter of time? I, I, let me answer it this way. Speaking of elusivity, but let me answer it this way: the the dependency, the Saudi Israeli relations or Saudi Israeli normalization will be dependent on two things. It will be dependent on, firstly, what happens on the Palestinian front. There has to be something, mm -hmm. something tangible that Saudi Arabia will then build upon its legitimacy and legitimize its relations with Israel based on that aspect. So we're going to have to ask that the time depends on that. 
Well, that's one aspect of it. The second thing is that, well, what can they get from the United States too? And because if what the Abraham yeah. Accords also showed is that it shifted the burden of concessions from Israel to the United States. Fascinating. And so it, it's not just the concessions. It's really what can Saudi Arabia can get also from this? This is this is my analysis. And so here we're looking at two different things. If there is some now currently the international relations of Saudi Israeli relations, I would say kind of the things that are going around this relationship does not lend itself. The political landscape does not lend itself. The Saudi, you know, I don't see Biden yielding too much to you know really put forward uh forward a package that will just make make it very difficult for saudi to saudi to reject right uh nor do i see good relations with between biden and and bibi um especially today when the foreign minister um the the, the israeli foreign minister spoke with the with the lavrov uh, and that kind of received some criticism from the United States. So mm -hmm. what they're trying to say is that, OK, listen, Israel, what Israel will try to do where well, they will be very active to get normalization is to really generate as much momentum as possible in D.C. To to con convince either Congress, the White House, all these elements, like give them an offer that they can't refuse in order for them to normalize here. Now, I see this. Th th this connection being taking place here and normalization will depend on what happens with these two very contingent elements here that are taking place if one is very very much then we may see if one if there is something on the palestinian front then it can it, you know it's worth noting the arab peace initiative many people don't understand the arab peace initiative and many people want to criticize the arab peace initiative especially within israel and consider it as an as something that is not negotiable and it's actually designed to be negotiable the language within the Arab peace initiative is designed to be negotiable designed to be flexible it's designed to do this but people but the the, the one of the weaknesses of framing and delivering such a foreign such a such a such a document and constructing such a language is that you could also communicate it, but at the same time, it could be easily denied. You could say, well, we could, you know, no, it's not negotiable. And actually it is because Saud al-Faisal, for example, said the benefit, the strength of this Arab peace initiative is it's, um, is that it does not go into details. And second, so it's based on principles. And the secondly also, you know, he said, listen, it's up to the Arabs they they could deny they could they could change it they could mold it they could adapt it it's up to them and in 2016 there was talk in the arab in the arab league to actually construct it and make it more flexible as a basis of negotiation the netanyahu interview with al arabiya two weeks ago was that two weeks ago or a week ago mm -hmm. he's he was asked he's like listen use the arab peace initiative as a basis of negotiation so when you're looking at, of course, Al Arabiya, Saudi. So here is a is a is a is a sign that could be easily denied, and says, "Listen, we work within this framework. Work within this framework, and then and then you know we could see what happens." So it, it's a very fluid issue, and there's just another thing that I wanted to to also say. For example, say in the future, maybe I I I will say the forces seem to be going that way anyway the the the, the globalization forces the forces of economic diversification etc seems to be going that way pushing that way but is a lack of a palestinian state something good or is saudi arabia normalizing relations outside the framework of the arab peace initiative or not without something tangible in the palestinian issue good is it okay it is not okay and i tell you who doesn't say it's okay so many israelis think it's not okay and the reason being is because what they see saudi arabia as a leverage on a on a israeli government 
to apply pressure to get something on the ground for Palestinians because what's going to happen is that, as you both know, it's going towards an apartheid regime. And what will happen is that, listen, you're going to have either a an Israel that is is not governed by Jews, if everyone has the same rights, mm-hmm. or an Israel that is not democratic whatsoever, and both are against the fundamentals of Zionism. So many people think Zionism is just... Is, is, there's, Zionism is complex. There's strands of Zionism, some strand, you know, and and but those are the principles of Zionism. So we're, we're what I think is is fruitful to discuss is really the costs of a Saudi-Israeli normalization outside a Palestinian state or a solution outside the Palestinian state, and 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 that is something that I don't think many people are talking about. That's why I thank you guys for making me think about this. And that's the next thing that I will write about. <laughs> well, it's just really so enriching, Dr. Aziz. This is great. Um, you 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 make a, a really interesting point when you talk about the burden of concession has now moved from Israel to, to the U.S. And you see that in the Abraham Accords. I mean, essentially, the U.S. bought off Morocco and Sudan. I mean, to, in order to, uh, you know, Sudan is not, you know, in order to, you know, the Trump administration recognized Moroccan control over the disputed Western Sahara as an incentive for Morocco to come on to this. You know, again, with Sudan, which you pointed out, is not ratified. It, but, you know, they, the, the, you know, the U.S. removed Sudan from a, the State Department list of state sponsors and, you know, gave it a, a $1.2 billion loan to help clear its World Bank debt. So so these were U.S. concessions. These weren't Israeli concessions. Mm. Um uh, also, before we have to get a little a plug in here for your scholarship, you also wrote a really uh, another excellent article for the Arab Gulf States Institute called in November called "The Depth of the Palestinian Ingredient in Saudi Political Identity and Projection." Again, I recommend that. Um, uh, this has been fascinating, but there was there's one last element, uh, Aziz, if we can get there, and, and you mentioned that you'd like to talk about that. Something we talk about on the nine six six, and I mentioned we did a one big thing. Uh, on the uh, the changing Saudi perception of itself in the world order, uh, and I, I spoke about and and Lucia and I discussed, you know, how 2022 was such a consequential year in that. And two two basic things, you know, the the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine forced really a a, a a global reassessment of where people stand. You know, Saudi Arabia is going to going to end this year as a trillion dollar economy, first time it ticked over. You know, it puts it very much in that middle power, you know, segment of of yes. uh, countries. It sees itself differently now. Um, yeah. How does that impact all of this? Uh, all of the, with the, with you, know, the that, it, you know, it's, you know, how does it, you know, in terms of its relationship with Israel, or the region, its responsibilities uh, with regard to the Abraham Accords, you know, that which say, of course, they're, you know, they're not part of. But, you know, does it does it change how it wants to navigate the the world going forward well personally i i, I see this of course as you you guys rightfully mentioned this that you know it sees itself different and i think within this process of changing of world order and and the multi multipolarity of it and i just wanted to mention about this multipolarity by the way i think yeah. to say it's a it's a pure multipolar system now I don't see Saudi Arabia viewing it as a pure multipolar system. I think Saudi views the international world order as an asymmetric multipolar system. And what I mean by that is that it still sees the United States as its preferred security guarantor, its main partner, its main security partner, not Allah, but main security partner. Uh, But it won't think twice going elsewhere. Um, and I think that's the difference, you know, mm-hmm. between what, what what's going on. And when it comes to this idea of, you know, that's what I was talking about with becoming a force now that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the ambition. I'm telling you, I, I've lived in the UK for 13 years. I left from 2005, came back and I could feel I could sense the ambition all throughout Saudi Arabia in, 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 in all places. I mean, in every circles and in, 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 you know, that, 
there is a there is a there isn't just a, a, a political identity, a foreign policy projection, but there's even a you know something within Saudis now in Saudi society that I that I see myself. Um, but how I see this taking place, and I think with the Abraham Accords and 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 the Arab Peace Initiative, for example, or the Saudi position, uh, what Saudi will not join the Abraham Accords and it will not be in its benefit to join the Abraham Accords because it will then be seeming like following a trend set by the UAE, which is what I meant by the legacy. Mm -hmm. This is the legacy here. So now as Saudi Arabia is growing and as Saudi Arabia is attracting more and more divestment uh, investments, more attraction, and it's becoming a you know, a global player, not just in oil, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's becoming a tourist hub. It's becoming a place where people want to invest, you know, and, and we still have some time to go, but, but it's, it's going there urgently. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think when it comes to Arab Israeli relations, it will have a framework that speaks to its legacy, not following a legacy of the Abraham Accords. Uh -huh. Because that's already been dictated and kind of uh, trailblazed by someone else who, in itself, by the way, they're, they're, everyone's taking notes of 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 this is this is an experiment and what what's going on here. Right. <laughs> you know, there 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 was limitations. There are benefits to this, but there are limitations too. So this is all part of the calculation of how a, a potential deal in the future will be. Now. Personally, I argue the Arab Peace Initiative in itself is broad enough to to accept something in the future, whether that's a transactional transactional nature of relations. Okay, if you if you stop this, then we could do this, and then if you stop that, then we could do that. Maybe that's one aspect of it. But when you have something that's built on principles, uh, it opens up a lot of options. And I anticipate, and there's another thing, by the way, you know, I won't be surprised if normalization takes a while because why buy the cow when you could get the milk? <laughs> you, you know, there, there's a lot of things, you know, what I argue in my work is that I reconceptualize cooperation and I say cooperation is not just tacit or or official secret or open there's also passive and active forms and what i mean by this is that actually uh saudi israeli cooperation at times especially for example with iran or 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 the economy etc is a harmonious form of relations and sometimes they cooperate by getting out of each other's way mm -hmm rather than actually working towards each other this is the this is what i meant by actually the cons you know saudi israeli relations is actually pushing the boundaries the conceptual boundaries of things that we always say of, of concepts so when someone comes in with a framework or a concept of alliances it doesn't explain this but when someone says okay well passive cooperation and what it, what is meant by passive cooperation and it's actually a way of just saying you know what let's cooperate by just getting out of each other's way uh this is this is a very interesting form that that's deniable, legitimate, and and you don't need to normalize relations to get sometimes your goals together, mm -hmm. because the overarching regional goals spills over into the other regional's goals. So there's a very delicate balancing here that takes place, and you know Saudi, I I've always been very fascinated with Saudi foreign policy. Um, um, and Saudi language, it, it comes, I, I don't know if you guys have time or not, but it comes actually from my grandmother who used to tell me stories about my grandfather who was, who used to work with, with King, King Faisal and he, he was, was diplomat. You know, yeah. 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 I mean, he was, he was in his, he, he was in his, in his Royal court and how they were very, you know, how they were very, how they would communicate very implicitly with each other. You know that's what really inspired me. I would I would hear her stories telling me it again and again, 
And that's what really inspired me to, to I was like, all right, I really want to expand upon this, you know, and, 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 you know, the Saudi ruling elite, historically, even the days of Ibn Saud, what made them survive was pragmatism. It was bravery. It was, it was okay, wisdom, but, but it was pragmatism. They knew how to understand. They knew how to use language very well. They knew how to gain ambiguity on their side. And they knew how to postpone and delay that language was such a which is such a fascinating instrument of survivability and 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 we always talk about diplomacy and it's like it's like uh the fork is on here and the knife is on here and, and all this kind of you know diplomacy is a, is a survival mechanism it's so fascinating that we see and, and another thing and then i'll shut up because i'm, I'm talking too much here, but uh, but another thing is that you know many people talk about you know these bedouins these you know these 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 nomads these these you know camel milk drinking people and date eating you know what do they know about what do they know about sophistication of politics what they do in their language requires a multidisciplinary approach to actually explain this aspect of communicating something yet withdrawing it at the same time so I had to I had to go to psychoanalysis and understand <laughs> and understand the language of and, and Lacan and 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 kind of com, you know this these other concepts. It's a complex, very fascinating, sophisticated process that Saudi ruling elite have been practicing, you know, and, and exercising throughout their history. This is why I think it's very worth looking into. Richard, I think uh, enriching is the word you used a few minutes ago. That would be a perfect way to describe this conversation with Dr. Aziz. Yeah. Dr. Aziz al Gashayan, Saudi researcher and writer who joins us from a still rainy Riyadh. Keep an <laughs> eye out for Dr. Aziz. He's often quoted, quoted in media outlets like the NYT, France 24, Sky, BBC. The list could go on. Uh, Dr. Aziz, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the cowboy thing kind of clashes with the burgundy, with the uh, blue, the blue and, and silver. I think burgundy and gold would fit in with the motif there. But uh, thank you so much for the time and this awesome discussion today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all. You guys are fantastic. You guys are, you, you, you got, I hope we have more people like you that have the same philosophy. And I'm just so honored and honored to be joining you guys. So thank you very much. The honor was ours and the education was ours. This was really informative, uh, Dr. Aziz. Thank you so much.